Ridgefield only recently learned from the Ridgefield Press what its Planning and Zoning Commission has planned for it over the holidays. A brand new, so-called inclusionary zoning regulation that simply can't wait for the new year. It starts with a public hearing two days after Christmas that will be held entirely by Zoom. Even so, Rob Hendrick, its chairman, ironically claims that he's hoping for a good turnout. With a vote within 65 days of closing the public hearing, but may possibly vote the same night. By squeezing this between Christmas and New Year's, he may be able to duck the ire that the Affordable Housing Committee stirred. Learn how planning and zoning is modeling Darianne's inclusionary zoning regulations. Get a tour of Darianne's exploding inclusionary development from Peter McGinnis and get the ignored facts on the incompatibility of Darianne's solution for Ridgefield. This is Kirk Carr on the record. Inclusionary zoning is one of the goals which is in our uh, town's draft uh, 8-30J affordable housing plan. Uh, I think it's one of the goals that we agreed when we reviewed that plan earlier in the summer that you know should be more of a no-brainer. It should be one of the one of the easy ones to get done. So just you know to level set with folks um, what what inclusionary zoning is when we talk about that term. Um, inclusionary zoning regulations can require, support, or incentivize the development of affordable housing in a municipality. In Connecticut, we're perfectly enabled, allowed, permitted to do these things that we're going to talk about uh, by a section of the of the statutes called 8-2I. A lot of all the zoning stuff's in eight. Is <laughs> it kind of probably catching on? Um, and 8-2I, by the way, was was uh, incorporated by a public act in 1991, so not long after 8-30G, which I think was 1990. Um, what we are able to do, if we want to, in our regulation, there's basically two categories of inclusionary zoning to talk about. One is mandatory category or minimums, people would call it. So in this case, you would potentially establish that all future development or all developments that fit certain criteria, zones, size-wise, whatnot, will definitely be required to include an affordable housing component. And we can we can have this debate and, and you can do it in a regulation like, you know, whether it's area median income, state median income, et cetera. But you can mandate affordable housing in all development of a certain type. The other thing you can do very often in inclusionary zoning is you can create an incentive for developers to mm -hmm. in, in, incorporate affordable housing. Um, that typically you do that through an overlay zone where you provide uh, developers the ability to build additional units. They wouldn't, they might be entitled to de develop 20, you know, units on a piece of ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they make five affordable, then they can do 25. That's the sort of thing that would be an incentive. Sometimes you modify setbacks and other things that are kind of, you know, otherwise you'd have to do this, but with an affordable component, you do something a little bit more uh generous or easy for the developer. So important thing for to make sure everybody's aware, Ridgefield already has some uh, incentive-based uh, inclusionary zoning regulations. We have in the B1, B2, and B3 zones, uh, the ability for developers to get additional, uh, to build residential units that they wouldn't necessarily be able to build if those residential units are affordable. Uh, you get essentially density bonus units. The regulation has been an abysmal failure. It hasn't done yes. the same thing. That's, uh, thank you, John. I didn't want to say it, but you've been around long enough. You can say it. Um, I think uh, it's, it's, it is it's fair to say that uh, in the time that that regulation has been in effect, and I think, John, it was 2017. And Mike, I, I would take your word on that. I, I think we've had virtually no use of these incentives, but they do exist. Um, and we have a bunch of different types of them. So for discussion now for tonight, and I'll, I'll kind of, I, I won't quite leave you on this. I'll give you a quick survey of what other towns have done, and then I'll shut up. But for discussion tonight is, okay, incentivizing. The carrot is not really working that well in Ridgefield. <laughs> um, do we want to add mandatory minimums? If yes, what, you know, what do they look like? You know, do we have a minimum number of dwelling units, a minimum percent of affordable? And I'll start with a straw man. People can kick it around, which is what the straw man's for. Disagree. Um, 
we might do something along the lines of for any new development or project with more than four units, dwelling units, we would require a minimum of 15 to 20% affordable in the project. That would be every single project that comes in that's five or more dwelling units. We could potentially, what some towns do, and you'll see in the comparison, is you set a mandatory minimum and then you offer incentives on top of that. So if you did a mandatory minimum of say 15 to 20% in new projects, you could say, and we'll give you an incentive if you bump it up to 20 or 25%. Um, obviously, you, know, you can also allow the commission to have some discretion in terms of the incentives that's done in other towns. Um, and obviously, by the way, we, you wouldn't push it much past 25% because at 30%, the developer's eligible for 830G. I won't read every line on this grid, but just to share it, and I'll leave it up on the screen maybe as we talk, if, if everybody likes that. These, this is a comparison of towns. So I spoke with, uh, with fellow chairs of other planning and zoning commissions in, in uh, Fairfield County. We have a kind of an informal group that we communicate with. I asked them for their experience and feedback. I also actually pulled their regulations. And the executive summary of this big grid is that um, most towns do not have a, a mandatory minimum and Ridgefield is like that. Um, but an interesting example, most of them do uh, offer incentives, which is like Ridgefield. Um, but interesting examples would be Darien. I put them at the top because I thought they were the more interesting to discuss. Darien actually has a mandatory minimum. They, they are actually what the, my straw man is sort of based on them. For any development that's more than four dwelling units, whether it's a multifamily project or a single family subdivision, by the way. So any type of, any time a developer comes in front of the Planning Zoning Commission and is gonna add four housing units in Darien, or five, sorry, there's more than four or five or more, uh, at least 14% of the, of the units must be at 80% SMI. That's a mandatory minimum. Now, uh, Darien also allow, provides incentives on top of that minimum if, you go, if the developer comes in with 25% um, affordable in their project. So again, I won't read them all. The others, by the way, Reading, Greenwich, Westport, and Wilton are, a are somewhat closer to Ridgefield today. I think that's it for me. Yeah. Um, to some greater or lesser degree, if we are successful in, in doing what we're talking about, we will obviate the need for 8-30G housing. Because what we're trying to do here is to create housing that is affordable for certain people who want to live in Ridgefield who today can't afford it. So we're broadening that audience by what we're planning. That's number one. Number two, 8-30G is only a nightmare to those people who examine it cursorily. If you examine it in minutiae, 8-30G can be made to work for the developer. And I think that's what we need to have as our goal. Not that it should be 8-30G being okay for the developer, but it should be Ridgefield's plan is a good plan for somebody who wants to come in and build half a dozen houses. We could do in regulation what 8-30D does in broad stroke, That's obliterate right. zoning regulation. Just, you know, while we don't have anything particularly urgent, but it's also this is one of those things where at any moment we could be we could get an application for a you know 10 unit or 110 unit project and if we don't have this in place then there won't be this requirement. Darian Darian is the example. It's in the presentation that I did before you have in your email. So Ridgefield Planning and Zoning plans to diverge from most other neighboring towns that incentivize low income housing in developments with more than four units and start mandating 14% or more low-income units following the Darien model. Predicting how suitable this is for Ridgefield is debatable, but there is no mystery to how it's materializing in Darien. Okay, this is Kurt Carr. I'm uh, here with Peter McGinnis, who is a Darien resident, who's going to take us on a quick tour of the inclusionary zoning and how it's being played out in Darien. Inclusionary zoning, for those that uh, may not be familiar, uh, is an overlay zone, at least here in uh, Darien, that allows uh, uh, the developer to build uh, 
bigger than what might ordinarily be allowed, provided, however, that the developer includes a certain percentage of affordable uh, units, deed restricted affordable units uh, within the development. In town here, we've gone through a number of changes. Uh, currently, 14% of uh, housing uh, must be affordable in order to uh, comply with the affordable housing rules. And if we look across here uh, on the street, we see a uh, number of units, commercial units, uh, and uh, over here, some development that's going on. This is called the Corbin District, which is being developed by Baywater. Uh, and as you see, uh, several large uh, buildings, uh, and they're designed to match uh, sh uh, shape and uh, size of the brick buildings that uh, continue down uh, the street. Uh, and it'll be mixed uh, use, uh, commercial, primarily uh, restaurants, destination boutiques, as well as residential property. Across the street here, we see a number of low-lying, what used to be called anyway, taxpayer uh, commercial buildings. These are one-story uh, units. This whole area is coming down uh, to continue uh, the theme that we see here across the street. And then back, uh, as we'll see, even raising a post office. Uh, so this is a massive uh, scale. It's transformational uh, for the town. Uh, and again, uh, all designed to bring into uh, a town uh, an overlay zone, uh, which was improved by our planning and zoning uh, group uh, commission, uh, such that uh, affordable units uh, can be uh, added uh, into the town, at, again, at that 14% rate. When you say affordable what, and deed restricted, you mean low income restricted it, to? Low income restricted. Um, and uh, means means to uh, kind of mimic uh, the language that we find in 830G. So this is the Corbin building, building which is uh, one of the uh, uh, buildings that will be coming down. Uh, this area is going to be called the Corbin District. It's going to be a mixed-use development and include a total of 116 multifamily units. Uh, 14 of those are going to be deed-restricted uh, affordable housing. But we can see the size and the scale of the uh, the development here that's going on uh, what's what surprises people here you know i think just uh if you look at the scale and the size i mean i think what surprises uh at least some people is just the uh the height of the development but this is in naroton just kind of one view and we'll uh, take a look around at the other side here the uh darian commons as it's called uh formerly uh uh, stop and shop uh, over here in Naroton. Uh, really, again, designed to be a mixed uh, commercial residential development. And we see uh, over at the, uh, the far end uh, the number of the residential uh, properties. So three major redevelopment projects in town approved. Uh, Federal Realty is the Naroton Heights uh, neighborhood north side of Heights Road and uh, rezoned, uh, redeveloped. Uh, Mixed-use development will include a total of 122 housing units, a mix of one and two bedrooms. Uh, 16 will be deed restricted affordable housing as uh, required under uh, our Section 580 of the zoning regulations. Occupancy of some of the dwellings uh, likely to occur starting in late uh, uh, 2022. You can see some of these buildings probably are close to completion and then into 2023. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kirk. The Darien's inclusionary zoning is distinguished from Ridgefield's in one very important way. Darien's inclusionary regulations are limited to an overlay zone. In contrast, Ridgefield's transformational inclusionary regulations apply to all zones within the town of Ridgefield, including residential industrial, central business district, and commercial. These are not even limited to the areas where current inclusionary incentives apply. As Mr. Katz accurately observes, this obliterates zoning regulations in every Ridgefield neighborhood. What on earth could he and his fellow commissioners possibly be thinking here? John Katz, a long-serving member of the Planning and Zoning 
Commission capsulizes it this way. The reason that we're all around this table, and that reason is 8-30G. And let's not kid each other. If there were no 8-30G, we'd be shaking each other's hands and saying, Jesus, can you afford rent this month? Yeah, well, I'm going to speak by a real tough. You don't have affordable housing to walk away. And that would be the end of it. But not if we've got this bugaboo about going for 10%. Because it's a bugaboo. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And if there were a achievable, we shouldn't be there. Because it would mean the town would be ruined. A 3G is a 33-year-old statute that is a very small stick that casts a very long and threatening shadow. Except towns of which there are only 31 in Connecticut must have 10% of their total housing units restricted to low-income households that have incomes below 80% of the area or state median income, whichever is less, and rents must not exceed 30% of income. Developers need only to deed restrict 30% of the units in a development to low-income households to nullify local zoning regulations. Then they can build pretty much whatever they want anywhere regardless of zoning regulations. If planning and zoning denies the application, an appeal is not only a slam dunk but to add insult to injury, the town is liable for all legal expenses. It's an urban legend that such developments provide affordable housing for teachers and police, few if any of whom qualify. Developers still must weigh the size of the addressable low-income qualifying market and be able to charge market rate units enough of a premium to offset the sacrificed income on the restricted units. Filling those low-income restricted units often comes with unintended consequences, incompatibility with market rate tenants, and elevated rental delinquency rates. As a result, more developers will threaten 830G than will actually build such developments, though when they do, they can be extremely disruptive to a neighborhood. While this may be intellectually dismissed as a bugaboo, the Planning and Zoning Commission seems to have it indelibly recorded on their brains and can't seem to shake the notion that Ridgefield must increase low-income restricted housing toward the arbitrary and capricious 10% goal, even though it makes no common sense and threatens the very essence of what makes Ridgefield Ridgefield. If not for 830G, what problem does mandatory low-income housing solve for Ridgefield? Between 2010 and 2019, Ridgefield's population increased 3% to just over 25,000. Total households, not shown here, increased 5% to just over 9,000, while housing units increased 9% to 9,736 units, or more than 700 unit a surplus. The poverty population varied between 464 in 2018 and 776 in 2014, while low-income restricted units increased to 284, a 48% increase. The number of people on poverty per low-income unit dropped from 3.18 per unit to just 1.74 per unit. There is no shortage of housing or low-income housing in Ridgefield much less a housing crisis in need of urgent repair. Are there compelling parallels with Darien that make Darien a compatible model for Ridgefield to adopt? To the naked eye, these two towns may look very similar, but in fact, they are very different. Ridgefield, at 34.5 square miles, is almost three times the area, yet Ridgefield's population is only 15% larger, at just over 25,000. And Darien's growth rate over the last 10 years is more than double Ridgefield's 2.9%. And Darien's density per square mile is 2.4 times greater than Ridgefield's at over 1,700 per square mile compared to 725 per square mile for Ridgefield. Ridgefield has just over 9,000 households and 9,736 housing units or a surplus of 735 units, or 8%. Darien has 6,895 households and 7,278 housing units, or a surplus of 383 units, 
or 5.5%. Darien is has a much tighter housing market, experiencing much faster increases in demand than Ridgefield. When it comes to poverty and low-income housing, statewide poverty is just under 10%. In Darien, it is less than half that at just 4%, and Ridgefield is half Darien's poverty rate at 2%. Low-income subsidized housing statewide is 11.6% of total households. In Darien, it's 3.6%, in Ridgefield, 3%. Thus, the state has a 1.7% surplus of low-income units to poverty. Ridgefield has a 1% surplus, and Darien, a slight 0.4% deficit. Looking at the cost burden households' incidence, Ridgefield at 34.7% is below both the state and Darien. For homeowners, it is slightly above Darien and the state, but for renters, it is well below Darien and slightly below the state as a whole. What problem is Ridgefield trying to solve by emulating Darien? None of us is Nostradamus, nor has the gift of perfect foresight, but there are professional demographers who have made educated guesses about Ridgefield's and Darien's future and their diverging population and demands for housing. Over the next 20 years, the Connecticut State Data Center projects that Ridgefield's population will shrink 4%, compared to Darien, which is expected to increase 10% and eclipse Ridgefield. Ridgefield doesn't need inclusionary zoning that attracts high densities, uncontrolled traffic congestion, and distorts the market with low-income restricted mandates. What does it need? Um. Personally, I would like to see a greater diversity of housing, not just under 8-30G, but middle income, etc., uh, creating that diversity we need. And the state doesn't want to hear that, but it may be something for the future that we need to look at. You know, you're balancing, do we build? Do we create traffic? You know, all the pluses and minuses that go in that have been debated for years at many planning and zoning subdivision applications that are going on and on. And I've listened to traffic experts over and over say this project will have no negative impact <laughs> on the traffic in your community. And at one point I'm planning and zoning, I said, I've been listening to you for four years, and now the traffic is backed up all the way to Tanton Hill. Well, we know how far it goes today. Mm -hmm. So for those who say that zoning has zoned out people is not true. The market has. Here are seven takeaways. There is no housing shortage, much less crisis in Ridgefield. Ridgefield's addressable market for low-income restricted units is saturated. That is why inclusionary incentives seem to have failed and why arbitrary low-income restriction mandates are likely to backfire. Ridgefield's population trends and projections do not justify large-scale development. Darien and Ridgefield present very different problems and opportunities. Zoning regulations that may serve Darien are unlikely suited for Ridgefield. Planning and zoning would be well advised to stop and answer these nine questions before rushing to adopt Darien's model. Is Darien the best model for Ridgefield to follow? Would Ridgefield benefit from the scale of development now exploding in Darien? Do Ridgefield's addressable market and prospects for growth project to Darien densities? Is out-of-control traffic congestion the unavoidable price of progress? How should zoning regulations manage density intensification? Is the threat of 830G an irrational fear distorting sound zoning policy decisions? What would Mr. Katz consider a successful consequence of residential zoning if there were no 830G. And how are inclusionary mandates justified in all Ridgefield zones? What, if any, research has planning and zoning completed on the intended and unintended consequences of mandatory inclusionary low-income housing regulations? Rushing through this over the holidays is irresponsible, ill-conceived, and a disservice to the voters and to the future of Ridgefield. It punctuates the abject disregard of public opinion and input as recently described 
by Mr. Katz. It is not the purpose of the Planning and Zoning Commission to reflect the will of the people. This is not an RTM. This is a Planning and Zoning Commission, and it's our responsibility to take into consideration all the facts that are presented at a public hearing and try to weigh them and come up with a sensible decision and ben to benefit the town. It is definitely not to represent the will of the people per se. I just wanted to clarify that point. Inclusionary zoning, you know, should be more of a no-brainer. It should be one of the one of the easy ones to get done. If this is a no-brainer, maybe planning and zoning needs to think again. This is Kirk Carr on the record.